Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to, I was gonna say Tuesday, but it's not Tuesday. It's Wednesday in Tuesday's disguise, sort of. Although, I guess probably a lot of you were here Monday anyway, so it's fully, fully Wednesday for you, but I had one extra day off. I'm sorry. You'll make it up, you'll get, you'll get days off that I don't, so it'll, it'll all balance out, it'll all be fair. Um, good morning to people who are online too. Um, I'll say hi to you here this morning as I usually do. So Ryan is here. Good morning to Ryan. And Shania is here. Good morning, Shania. Uh, Simrat's here. Good morning, Simrat. Um, Abby's here. Good. Good morning, Abby. There we go. Um, Azza's here. Good morning. And Nasra's here. Good morning. And Nicole is here. Good morning, Nicole. Um, okay. And Basil's here. Good morning. Come on in. So, 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 yesterday, um, <coughs> yesterday we kind of, if you missed it or forgot or are still in holiday mode, um, we just talked quickly about the syllabus and, and what was going to be kind of in this class and how the class would work. And so I'm kind of live streaming here all the time during class and, um, of course, all of those live streams get posted on YouTube, so if you want to see something again, you can always go back, but that doesn't mean you should sleep or not pay attention in here because I guarantee you it will be harder to go back later on, so it's easier to do things the first time. Um, and of course, we have some online people who we just said good morning to, and they'll be, um, uh, they'll be sort of online for the term, or the, uh, but I think some of them will um, clear quarantine and, and hopefully show up in the room soonish. Um, we said that um, things will be posted on Student Portal and we said that they'll be posted on Microsoft Teams and so the syllabus is already there uh, and I'll post lecture slides and readings for you that we'll, that we'll need for the class. Um, that's kind of what we did, kind of what we did yesterday, right? Okay, do you want to, do you want to dig in? Want to start? If we have to? Yeah. The, you're, you're, you're paying me to start, so I'm going to, I'm going to do my job, okay? Okay, so the first part of um, kind of social justice has to do with, kind of has to do with a little bit of background perspective. Um, part of kind of learning about social justice issues and talking about them and, and resolving them, in part has to do with um, kind of learning how to understand and look at these at these issues, okay? So there's, there's a few things we have to talk about in terms of um, how we know what we know and what knowledge is and how people think about the things that they know. Um, this section of the course will seem a little like, it, it'll seem just a little strange, it'll seem a little abstract, it'll seem like, oh, why are we talking about this? But it, it'll make a little more sense as we go forward and talk about sexism and racism and things like that. So it'll, you'll, you'll see the reason why we talked about some of these things a little bit later on. So don't panic. I almost know what I'm doing. No, I know what I'm doing. Um, so maybe the first question that we can ask or is what social justice is and why we should care about it and how can we understand it? Could I, could I ask you that? Maybe now, like what we, we talked a little bit about what social justice was yesterday. Um, but maybe I'll ask you the second question: Why? Why is it important? Why should we care about it? Why is there a whole class dedicated to this? Why are people talking about it in the media so much? What's the big? What's the big deal? Yeah, Basil. Yeah, so, so so we can stop, so we can stop racism, right? That's a that's a simple answer, but it's very very true, right? Um, why else should we care about this? Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so and, and we could probably ap apply that to really any. Any, any group that faces discrimination, yeah, like, 
do you want to feel safe when you leave the house? Yeah, right, of course you do, right? So do I. And, you know, it's not, you know, do we want to live in a society where people don't feel safe to go out of their house? And I think for most of us the answer is, the answer is no, right? And so, yeah, that's something that we, that we need to fix, right? If people don't feel safe even to leave their house, that's a, that's a problem, right? That's, that's something that needs to be solved. Mulder, what were you going to say? Yeah, so you could minimize inequality in society. Why, why would we, why would we want to do that? So everyone get a fair chance at doing something. Right. So everyone can get a fair chance at doing something. Is it is that important? Do you think? Of course it is. Yeah. So um, in part, what the reason why we might care about social justice has to do with our internal values, right? So. Mulder, you're kind of saying like, yeah, it's important that we have fairness, right? It's important that everyone gets opportunities to do the things that they want to do or achieve the things that they want to achieve, right? So there's, there's some kind of internal values attached to that, right? Why, good morning. Hi, hey, how you doing? Thank you, how are you? I'm good. Um, why else should we care about social justice? Religions are fighting each other. Sorry, religions? Yeah. Yeah. So, in, in in addition to people maybe not feeling safe, um, inequality can actually cause pretty severe conflict, right? And and of course, religion. If you look back in world history, has a very long <laughs> there's a very long history of religions kind of not agreeing with each other and fighting with each other. But that's not really good for people's lives either, right? We don't really it's difficult to live in a society where there's open conflict, right? And um, so, yeah, that's, that's an important thing as well. Um, why else do you think we should care about social justice? Everyone can have his rights. Yeah, so, and, and maybe that's attached to values as well, right? So if you believe in human rights and if you believe the idea that everybody should have those rights regardless then yeah we we need to ensure that people's rights are respected right Re regardless of who they are if they're young or old or whatever race or religion or gender they belong to people have if, if you believe that people have inalienable, inalienable inalienable human rights so rights that cannot be taken away from them, then yeah, you would be, you would be interested in social justice, right? Now, the third question here is how can we understand it? And this is, this is how I'll, or this is the question I'll try to answer for you today, or, or at least start to answer. Hopefully by the end of this class, we'll have a good handle on how we understand these things. Um, so just to kind of reiterate what we said yesterday, social justice does have to do with values, right? It does have to do with, with what you think is important in here, right? And because the first part of this is that it maintains that all people in society deserve and should have access to the same rights and resources, right? So people should have access to food, right? And shelter and clean water and education, right? And safety, right? Um, People should have, um, oh sorry, I'll, the second point we also talked about, right? The idea that social justice embraces human rights. So if you feel that, um, if you value human rights and believe that all citizens are worth the same thing and deserve the same rights and opportunities, then, then yeah, social justice would be, would be important to you, right? Um, and the other part of social justice is not just a, an understanding, but an action, right? So what do we do, right? If we see that we have inequality in society and if we understand how that inequality works, the next step is kind of how do you, how do you fix it, right? How do you go about leveling the playing field for everyone in society? And sometimes that's a very easy answer and sometimes it's not so easy, but again, we'll, We'll get to that. But those are kind of the, the three pieces of this. The idea that 
you believe that everybody is equal and deserves the same rights, that we believe that um, people deserve equal access to resources and opportunities that they might, they might desire or they might need, and that where there is inequality in society, well, what can we do to fix that, right? And again, we can get into it a little bit later. The, there will probably always be some degree of inequality in society simply because we're all different people, right? We all have different abilities and talents, and so you know, there'll always be a little bit of inequality, but can we create a system where everybody who wants to work hard and has ability and talent can achieve what they want to achieve, or at least has the opportunity to do so, right? That's what we, that's what social, social justice wants. I don't know if that's what you want, but that's what social justice wants. Now, <clears throat> this topic is a little more complicated than we might think sometimes because it's connected to a lot of other things that we think and know and believe and we'll get to that a little bit later we'll try to pull that apart um, one of the ideas trying to understand anything never mind social justice but anything you're trying to understand is connected to your idea about how the world works right and so anthropologists or sociologists might call this worldview right so all of us have an idea about how we think the world works. And some of that has to do with the physical world and the universe. Some of it might have to do with God, if you believe in a God or multiple gods or how much power God has over human activities. That might be part of your worldview. Um, you might have worldview or you might have ideas about how you think society works, how politics works, how the economy works. Um, how you get ahead or how you don't, uh, what it is to be a good person. Um, all of these things are ideas that you have and they're very deeply held. We'll talk about that later too. And they kind of influence how you see the world. And so I guess I'll start off by saying that one of the things to remember is that we're always looking at the world through a pair of lenses, right? And our, our lenses are our previous knowledge, the things that we've learned um, things that we've learned from our culture and from our society. Religion is part of culture, but that counts. And so all of those things kind of make up a lens that you see the world through, right? And so I look out at the world around me and I see it from the perspective of a white man. I don't want to say middle age because that's depressing. A adult white man <laughs> who you know, who was raised in Canada and who is not super religious, right? That's kind of my background. That's where I see the world. I also don't come from a super rich family. I come from a kind of a average-ish family. And so that makes up how I see the world. And I look through the world with those lenses, right? Other people will see things very differently depending on their background and their culture and kind of where they come from, right? So all of us in the room, and I touched on this yesterday, all of us in the room are gonna see the world just a little bit differently because we all have different backgrounds, different cultures, different experiences, right? So all of us are looking at the same thing, but we're not necessarily all seeing the same thing. And that's, that's an important thing to remember and realize, okay? Some of the things I just talked about are ideologies. Okay, and so these are big ideas in society that are um, kind of mixed in with everything that we do and they're very easy to believe. We'll come back to one of these things later, but one of them is called, um, one big idea might be called meritocracy. Have you ever heard that word before? Meritocracy? It's the idea that if you want to achieve things in life, so if you want to fancy career or if you want lots of money or if you want to be famous you have to work hard and the harder you work the more success you get and conversely the people who aren't successful aren't working hard enough okay so that's a very easy idea to believe and, I, and again i can't speak for your background and culture and 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 what you think and know but here in North America, that's a very common big ideology, is that the harder you work, the
the more success you will get. The people who are successful, they're successful because they worked hard. The people who aren't successful, they're not working hard enough. And so that's a, that's a very easy idea to believe uh, because it's kind of mixed in with you know, everything that we kind of perceive around us in society. That will make more sense later. Um, and it's also easy to believe because there's some amount of truth to it, right? If you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a medical doctor, it's going to be a lot of work, right? There's going to be a lot of school, there's going to be a lot of training and papers, and it's not going to be easy to do, but it's not the whole story. We'll come back to that later. Um, again, this is a complicated question because of our values and our morals about what we think is right and wrong, right? And so, Mulder, we touched on a few things about belief, right? If you believe that human rights are important, not everybody believes that, right? Um, and some people have values that kind of override other ones. Yes, everyone should have equal opportunity, but only if they work hard sort of thing. And so these things get kind of complicated to pull apart, but we'll talk about that later too. Um, the other thing that we'll talk about is that we always exist in, um, in the context of other people. And so we always have to try to understand, or at the very least, at the very least we have to be aware of the fact that people don't see the same issue, people don't see a given issue exactly the way we do, right? There are other perspectives, there are other ideas. So we always have to be aware that other people see something might a little bit differently than we do. And probably the most important part of this is that the way you see it might not be right. <laughs> so, right? so there, there's a lot of different perspectives and you're gonna feel that you're seeing something the way it is, but everybody thinks that, right? Everyone's looking at things from a slightly different angle. And we'll talk about that. That has to do with this word that's probably new to you called positionality. And we'll talk about that shortly. Again, by the end of the course, we'll kind of understand how these, how these things really work, but I'm just trying to introduce them to you right now. Good so far? Easy peasy? Yeah? Okay. Right. The other thing that we'll do, um, and, and we'll talk about this today, is we're going to take a critical approach to social justice. And I don't mean critical in that we're going to criticize things. It's not, what I'm, it's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is that we're going to be looking at the world from a particular perspective, in a particular way. And so we're going to be looking at society and looking at the world with the idea that societies are stratified, okay? So a strata is, I think it's a Latin word for a layer. And so things that are stratified have layers. I like to think of cake because because I like cake, <laughs> and cake sometimes has layers to it. So layered cake is stratified, right? There's like a cake layer, and then there's like a creamy custardy layer, and then maybe there's another cake layer, and maybe you've got some mousse or something, and then you've got something else. Mm, sorry. <laughs> if I'm making you hungry now, I apologize. Um, but cakes are kind of stratified like that, and society is stratified like that as well. And it's stratified along a number of different lines. And so um, society is kind of like a cake, except there are multiple layers going on at the same time. And so society is stratified along the lines of race, right? along economic class, along gender, sexuality, religion, um, citizenship, ability. All of these things create layers in society and so we can we can be in kind of multiple layers at the same time which is where the cake analogy doesn't really work um, but that's where it gets complicated and that's where a lot of people that you see in media sp start to have problems is because it's difficult to think about how someone is affected by their race and their gender at the same time or even multiple things right race and gender and sexuality. How do those affect that person's experience of the world? It's difficult to think about 
how those experiences work at the same time. But again, we'll get to that too. I said our perceptions of the world are not the same, right? We're all looking at an, at an issue from a slightly different angle. We're all looking at an issue through slightly different lenses, right? And the last part, and we'll talk about this too, is sometimes knowledge is counterintuitive. Do you know what counterintuitive means? It's a fancy word. If you can, if you can use it right, you'll sound really smart. Yeah, it, it kind of goes, it goes against our common sense, right? It goes against what you would think would be the case, right? Yeah, so things that are counterintuitive, things that are intuitive are things that you kind of, are, are easily understandable, right? They're easy to, you know, the, the ground is wet because it rained last night. It's very intuitive, right? Of course, of course, of course, right? Things that are counterintuitive are things that don't really seem like they should be right or your senses tell you one thing when the truth is actually something different. And I'll give you an example of that very shortly. Okay, oops, what's going on here? Right, okay, the critical, the critical stance. One of the, well, the ideas I wanna introduce to you here is the idea that humans are pretty, pretty interesting creatures because a lot of what we know a lot of what we know and how we behave is based on things that are socially constructed, okay? So a lot of things that, that humans use to sort of make decisions and understand their world and go about thing or go about their life, the rules that they follow are all socially constructed, right? And so, yeah, humans have this really interesting ability to act on things that are imaginary, but things that become real if everyone believes them, okay? With Nasra, you're like, what the hell, right? Does anyone, does anyone have like a, a, a piece of money on them? Does anyone carry money? No. I don't, oh. I don't either. So, <clears throat> so let's say Basel has a, a $20 bill, Canadian $20 bill, right? What is that dollar bill worth? Or what is that bill worth? There's an intuitive answer to this. It's worth $20, right? Why is it worth $20? Because what? Because it is, right? <laughs> because that's what it's worth. That's what it says on the bill. But of course, it only has that value because we all agree that it does, right? It is, I think if we look at it objectively, if it's a Canadian do a $20 bill, it's a piece of plastic. It has no use. You can't use it for anything else, can you? Can't eat it. You can't build anything with it. It is totally unuseful for anything at all, right? It just is a green piece of plastic that has a fancy design on it and it says $20. And so, Money is something that's socially constructed. It's an imagined reality. It only exists because we all believe that it does, right? And of course, that's why currencies go up and down, right? If you've been in your home country and seen your currency, you know, be valued and devalued, that's because money is only worth what people agree it is worth. And if you've ever seen your currency devalued, that means that <laughs> people don't think your money is worth very much and then suddenly it's not worth very much, right? So money is just one thing. So humans live in a world of imagined realities, things that are only real because we all agree that they are, right? Uh, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but it's weird. Um, yeah, and, and so these kind of social constructions have a huge impact on our life because again, they basically are real, right? Even though, even though they're not, they're not a, you know, um, when you meet someone, what do you normally do? Pre-COVID, now co COVID's, you know, screwed everything up, but what would you do if you met someone for the first time? You'd, you'd say hi or hello, 
you, you might tell them what your name was, maybe, or you might ask them what their name is. Uh, might you shake their hand? Pre-COVID, before COVID? <laughs> you, you might, right, depending on the context and depending on who the person was. Um, those are all kind of rules of social interaction, right? If I met you for the first time, pre-COVID, say I meet Daniel, oh, hey, Daniel, nice to meet you. What would you do? Yeah, we'd, we'd shake hands, right? Now, that's kind of a rule. That's a socially, that's a social rule that if I go, hey, nice to meet you, you're supposed to shake my hand. That's, that's the rule. Now, is that a rule of the universe? Will the space-time continuum tear apart if Daniel doesn't shake my hand? No, right? It's just an imagined rule. But you're supposed to do it, right? And if you don't do it, it's going to be it's going to be weird, right? I'm going to go, "Hey, nice to meet you." <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right? It's going it's going to be a little weird, right? But again, it's um, these rules kind of pattern how we behave. Okay, but we'll, again, we'll get to that later. There's more, there's more to say about that. Um, we talked about that. I'm just going to jump over it because that's more information than we need and we've, we've talked about it. Um, the other thing we should talk about in terms of sort of getting our heads in the right space is identity. Okay, and so identity, if you looked it up, and I did, um, is the... the the kind of the fact or being, this is what the dictionary says, the fact or being of who or what a thing is. So your identity is how you describe who or what you are. Um, and so if I asked you, and I, I am going to ask you, um, I'd like you to take just a couple minutes and either write down or type down or maybe just mentally organize if you can remember them. Um, the, mo the most important characteristics that make you you. So I want adjectives. What are, what are you like? I am this, I am this, I am something else. Descriptive words that tell me, not tell me, but that describe who you are. Know what I mean? Yes, no, maybe so? Okay, um, I am funny. That's debatable, but that's one example, okay? So come up with as many as you can in, in two minutes, and then we'll talk about them, okay? So go ahead, two minutes. Come up with as many descriptive words as you can. And I will put this nifty clock timer on the... better if you write them down so you don't forget. <laughs> Who are you? What are you like? How would you describe yourself? someone might even be how you like to think of yourself you know everybody doesn't have to agree with you <laughs> and online people if you um, at the end of our minute if you'd like to type some of those words into the live chat. That would be great, too, and we can, we can share those, if you don't mind.
Okay. So before I ask you what you said, is this an easy exercise or a difficult one? In between? Difficult? What? what? That's weird, isn't it? Isn't it weird? Why, why is it difficult? Because in theory, nobody knows you better than you. You spend all day with yourself, every day. I, at least I think you do. <laughs> and yet, it is difficult to describe you. Why is that? Because you don't know what you're doing. Because you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Well, that, that does tell us something about you. <laughs> That's, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to see yourself from the outside, right? And actually, that's, I don't know that we'll talk about, well, we might talk about it a little bit. That's kind of a sociological concept, the idea that, A, we, in part, we define ourselves by how other people see us and often we make choices based on I think it's Irving Goffman he says the looking glass self which is a bizarre term but a looking glass is a mirror so sometimes when we're trying to decide what to do we kind of think of we imagine someone looking at us and how, what would that person think of what I'm doing now right sometimes we do that but yeah but it's sometimes it's hard to see yourself because you're seeing yourself from the inside right and it's hard to turn it around and imagine how other people see you, right? Daniel, what were you going to say? No. No? It's a tricky one. You oh, yeah. Right. So, so part of understanding who we are has to do with other, other people, right? Comparing ourselves or at least putting ourselves in the context of other people, right? Maybe not comparing. Um, but anyway... Give me, give me some of your words here. So, so Ryan says he's a, bit of a, he's a bit of an introvert, right? And so, yeah, I get that. That's, that describes him, right? Uh, wh what other words describe, describe who you are? Impulsive. Throw them at me. Impulsive. Good. You're impulsive. What else? Social. What's that? Social. Social, yeah. What else? Pragmatic. Sorry? Pragmatic. Pragmatic? Yes, pragmatic, good. What else? Calm. Calm, good. Superstitious? Superstitious, okay. What else? Creative, Creative. okay. What else? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We, uh, which is, which is interesting. Um, only because of shy, but I want to be social. Which is interesting because that shows that a. Okay, that's, that's a piece of your identity. You're kind of shy. Two, it shows that we are social creatures, right? We want social interaction. Um, and three, it might even say that um, we value people who are social in society, right? The people who are often the most popular are the ones that are most outgoing and most talkative and will sort of talk to all kinds of people, right? So there's a few things in there, but yeah, shy. What else? Hardworking. Hardworking, okay, good. What, uh, what's that? Caring. Sorry? Caring. Caring, good, okay. What else? Carefree. Carefree. Serious. Serious. How about, how about some of these? Um, Azza's suggesting here, um, are, are you some of these things too? Maybe not, I, I hope none of your mothers or fathers yet. If you are, it's okay, but I hope not. Um, yeah, does, does that describe you as well? What else are you? Are you, a, are you a son or a daughter? Yeah. Brother or sister? Yeah. Are you a friend to other people, to some people? Yeah, you're somebody's friend. Uh, might be somebody's boyfriend or girlfriend too, right? So there's kind of social relationship um, social relationship aspects to who we are as well, right? So we have a, an identity that way. Um, what else might, what other kind of words might describe us? Sure. 
Sure. So right now, all of you are kind of our students, right? You're fulfilling, not fulfilling the role, but you're, you're assuming the role of students, right? So that's currently a part of your identity, right? Teacher is part of mine. If you are a religious person, that's important as well, right? If you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or something else, that's a piece of who you are as well. Um, what else? Um, yeah, do you think this is a part of who you are? Not important? What's that? Yeah, it's an identity, but, but is, does being a man or a woman, does your gender a kind of affect who, is that a piece of who you are? Not necessarily, but, but it, it is part of how you think of yourself as a young man or a young woman. Is that a piece of how you think of yourself? I kind of think so. I think it is. I think gender is, gender is a piece of who you are, I think. You can disagree with me if you want, but I, I think so. Um, yeah, are you a, a young person or an old person? Or somewhere in between? <laughs> yeah, that's an important piece too, right? Um, also, I'll throw this in here. Nicole said she's a good listener and she's sensitive at the same time. So sen being sensitive and being a good listener are also parts of identity, right? <coughs> give, me, give me two more. Give me two more. Independent, okay, good one. Positive, positive, okay, positive is good too. And there's one more here, I'll go, so, and Canadian might be as well, your, your nation, does your, does your nationality or your, the country you come from, is that a little piece of your identity too? Or your cultural background? Yeah, sure it is. So, identity is kind of full of all of these different pieces, right? What makes you, you has to do with, um, with a bunch of different characteristics. And so what's the point of that? Well, one of the things I wanted to point out in, in talking about this was that our identities kind of extend beyond our individual characteristics, right? So yes, I'm funny and independent and introverted and smart and you know, good looking and stylish and <laughs> you know, yes, I'm all these things, but our relationships to others are also important, right? In the way that, yes, I am a son, I'm a brother, I'm a boyfriend slash partner, um, I, I am a teacher, right? Not only are those kind of relationship roles important to who I am, but in some ways, if you think about it, you can't really be you without other people around, right? Can I be funny if there's nobody here to laugh at me? Maybe. Can I be caring if there's nobody here? No? What's that? I guess. Can I be a good listener if there's nobody here to listen to? No. What's that? Yes. So, you, okay. Let, let's leave him out of this for the, for the moment. Let's leave him out for the moment. Uh, Basil's caring, but can he be really caring if there's nobody here? No, right? So in a, in a strange way, we have all of these individual characteristics, but a lot of them have to do with how we relate to other people, right? So, you know, there's this, you've probably heard this saying that people say, if a, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, does it make a sound? Hmm. Exactly, right? It's supposed to be something that like, you know, makes you think. It doesn't make you think that much, I don't know. But but it's that's the case, right? Is that can you can you be you without other people around you? Right? And in some ways, maybe not so much, right? Because a lot of our pieces of our identity are based on how we interact with others, right? Are we caring? Are we funny? Are we a good listener? 
Are we sensitive? Sensitive has to do with how we interact with other people as well, right? Um, the third thing I wanted to point out is that group memberships are part of our identity as well. So I am a man, right? That's a, that's a part of who I am, right? I'm also Canadian. That's a part of who I am as well, right? And so our group membership is, is important and interestingly, it's often not the first way we think of ourselves, right? We often, when I ask you to describe yourself, often the individual characteristics come first, right? I'm sensitive and caring and funny and, you know, all that stuff. Usually that comes first, but we're not really taught to think of ourselves as part of some of these larger groups, right? As a man, as a Canadian, as a white person, right? We're not often, that's not the first things to come to mind. And I wanted to point that out because th that's exactly the kind of things that we will want to pay attention to in this class. So yeah, I have a bunch of individual characteristics and those are all great and they're an important part of who I am. But in terms of understanding what's happening in society, we also want to pay attention to the groups that people belong to, right? Because the group you belong to has a lot to do with how you experience society, okay? So being a man living in Canada is a different experience from being a woman living in Canada. Those things are not the same. It seems like they're the same, right? If I walk down the street with my girlfriend and, you know, we're just having a day out, yeah, we're seeing the same things and we're doing the same things, but we're having a slightly different experience. And a little part of that has to do with our gender, right? I'm approaching society from the perspective of a man, and society is also going to see me as a man and treat me as a man, whereas society is going to treat my partner as a woman, right? So there's going to be, there's going to be a difference there. And sometimes it's not always easy to know what that difference is and how it works, but we have to understand that it, the difference exists. Okay. Well, yeah, and we'll get to that. But yeah, that's that's true, right? Is that people? Yeah, that's a perfect example. It's easier for men to find work. Society will treat us differently, right? As a man and a woman, so we won't have the same. We won't have the same experience, right? We won't see things the same, even though we might be in the same place at the same time, doing or seeing the same thing. It'll be a little bit different for each of us, right? And. That's that, this is that idea of positionality that I want to introduce, this fancy word. And positionality basically just says that we recognize that our identities and, and kind of our group identities for the most part, um, in relation to others, influences what we can see about the world and, and what we can understand about the world, right? So it's very easy to think about this in terms of this room. Okay, so if I want to look at this room, I can look at it from here, yes? Yeah, so I'm sitting here, I can see the room. Okay, right, this is the room, I have observed the room. Are there things that I cannot see from my position here in the room? Yeah, right? For instance, I'm looking at Sophie back there, but I can't see what's going on in the corner behind Sophie, right? Now, Sophie can see that if she kind of turns around and looks, right? You can see what's going on back there. Probably nothing, <laughs> but, but I, can't, I cannot see that, right? And similarly, from where you all sit, you see the room from a slightly different perspective, right? There's things that you can see. There's things that you cannot see, right? I cannot see the board behind me. I have no idea what's going on up there. Well, I can guess, <laughs> but I have no idea, right? But can all of you see it? Yeah. yeah. Because I don't see it, is it not there? Is, is the board not there? It's there. Yeah, I'm not looking at it. Or from where I'm sitting, I cannot see it, right? I cannot see this thing from where I'm sitting. But of course, all of you are looking at the board and saying, yeah, there it is, right? it's right there. So this is an important thing for 
understanding society as well, is that the social groups that we belong to, whether we're men or women or gender non-binary, whether we're straight people or whether we're gay or bisexual or pansexual or lesbian, whether we are religious people, whether we're Christians or Muslims or Buddhists or something else, whether we're Canadian citizens or not, um, whether we're high socioeconomic status, whether we're kind of rich people or poor people, all of those things will affect our position in society the way that we see it. And some things will be much easier for some people to see and much more difficult for others to see. So it's just like the board, right? The board is very difficult for me to see from where I sit. I can kind of, you know, <laughs> move my eyes over here and see a little bit of it if I kind of strain. But for all of you, it's very clearly visible, right? It is right in front of you. You can't miss it, right? But again, from where I'm standing, it's hard for me to see. I have to work a little harder to see it. And that's a valuable metaphor because we should remember that about society as well, is that there are things that some social groups will see much easier, and there are things that some social groups will have a hard time, good morning, will have a hard time seeing, okay? And that doesn't mean that anything is more real than anything else, and it doesn't mean that anyone is right or wrong. It's just that some things exist and some things are just harder to see from where you are. Right? And so we won't, we won't dig into it too much, but racism is a perfect example, right? So for, and I'll give you a break in a few minutes because I know we've been going, going hard for about a 50 minutes here. Racism is a perfect example of this because as a white person in Canada, racism is something that's very difficult for me to see. It's not difficult for me to see, but it's more challenging for me to see. Why is that? Well, because it's not really directed at me. Are people racist towards white people in Canada? No, no, that's not, that's not how it works, right? And so I'm not, never on the receiving end of racism, right? If I see someone or hear someone say a racist thing, then yeah, I can say, yeah, that's, dude, that's racist, right? I can clearly identify that. But I'm not on the receiving end of it. And so for me, for a white person in Canada, racism is like the board, right? Some people can very clearly see it because it's pointed right at them. And for some people like me, it's more difficult to see, right? I have to work a little bit harder to see that it's there, right? So again, Positionality says that, yeah, we're all kind of in a different place in society. Our group memberships influence how we see the world and how the world treats us, how the world interacts with us. And that means that some people can see things better than others, right? And racism is a perfect example. If you are a person of color, it's much easier for you to see when racism is happening. If you are a white person, you have to work a little harder. Right? It's not quite so obvious. And so for me, I can't quite see the board from where I am. I can, you know, if with a little effort I can see it. It's no big deal, right? But for other people, it's right there. It's, right? Okay, do you wanna take a little break? Yeah, me too, okay. Let's take a little break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll talk about some other things, okay?
OK. And we're back. Um, right. So we've been talking a little bit about identity and who we are, or who we think we are anyway. We've talked a little bit about the idea that um, a lot of things in, in human society are is knowledge that is socially constructed, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and we've talked about the idea that our social group memberships are important. Um, and so, particularly for this course, maybe not so much, um, you know, it, it's important that we are, you know, funny and talented and sensitive and good listeners, that's, that is very good. But for this course, for understanding things, it's important to remember the group memberships that we belong to. And, you know, there's, you know, th there's, how should I say it? It, it? It's kind of a balance. It's kind of like we have to look at people in, in all ways, right? And so, you know, we don't want to treat people just according to their social group, right? We don't want to say, oh, here's, you know, here's a black female and here's a white male and we'll treat everybody according to their group memberships. We don't want to go that far over, right? Uh, but on the other hand, we don't want to simply, you know, we do want to treat people and see people as the individuals that they are, right? That's good. We definitely want to do that. But we want to do kind of both things at the same time, right? We want to be able to see people as unique, special individuals as they are, but we also want to remember that the social groups that they belong to and that we belong to will influence how we experience society. So it's, it's not either or, it's kind of both at the same time, okay? So don't forget one um, at the expense of the other. But again, those social groups will determine how we experience society and will determine how or influence how society treats us. Abby here asked, does privilege count as an example of positionality? Nasser, I'm going to go to you, and then I'll go to Abby. So, um, if, you, if you look at a person that's considered all of these black and Latino, wouldn't that make, um, how do I want to say this? Wouldn't you not want to look at that because it puts them in like a bubble? <laughs> right. Wouldn't Yes, and actually, okay. Ooh, okay. This is a good question. Uh, so, if you see if you see a black woman, right? Would you the the question is would you not want to, you know, wouldn't we want to do away with those classifications, right? Would we not want to, you know, would we kind of want to maybe not ignore it, but just not pay so much attention to that and pay attention to this individual unique person? Um, yes, absolutely. And I, and I think that's kind of the, the aspiration, right? That's the goal. That's where we want to be. We want to be in a place where, yeah, we're dealing with people, you know, for who they are, right? And, and, and I, I think you're right that way, Nazra. That's what we want to do. Um, the kind of unfortunate thing is that those social group memberships for that person, the, the fact that she's a woman and the fact that she's a, um, that she's a person of color or that she's a black person, um, those do affect her life, right? Um, and so we kind of have to pay attention to them in order to rectify inequality. So it's kind of like, you know what I mean? Um, y yes, I would, okay, um, wh give me a little bit more. Because it's obvious, like, I feel like it's the more you address it, the more you make it a thing. Right. Is it a thing? It is a thing. <laughs> it is, okay, so it is a thing, okay, so. It's. I, I, I see what you're saying, okay. Um, so the, the question is, just so we're all clear, um, we understand that, let's use the United States for an example, just to put a few boundaries on this. So living your life as a black woman in the United States 
is, is a particular kind of experience. And it's a different experience than white people, white women, and white men experience, right? Um, black people and black women in the US are clearly disadvantaged in a number of ways. There is data to show this, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So th that is a s that, that's a fact, right? That's, that's a fact that we're dealing with. So Nasser's question is, do, why do we have to keep pointing this out, right? Why do we have to keep talking about this when we know that this is the case? Um, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about that? I have a few things I would like to say, but I, I want to hear what you think first. Because it's a, it's a good question. It's a really good question. And in fact, in some ways, it's actually hard to ask a bad question in this class. But that's a good one. What do you think? What, wh why do we have to keep talking about this? Because you can't change the world. Because you can't change? OK. So you can't change the whole community or society, so? Right. Um, yeah, so I, okay, so if, if, if I could paraphrase what you said, um, is the idea that, you know, in, in order to sort of get messages across, sometimes you have to keep saying it, right? You have, because there's a lot of people in society, you know, people are, you know, people are on their phones, they're not paying attention. And so we kind of have to keep talking about things until everybody absorbs the message and gets on board, right? It takes a long time. Is, is that kind of what you're saying? Right. So you're going to have a communication. Yeah. Well, and, and <clears throat> actually, that, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So what you're talking about, and, and we're not there yet, but what you're talking about it is social messaging, right? And the fact is, is that people, um, black women and black people in the U.S. are disadvantaged because of a long history of social messaging, right? People have absorbed a lot of negative stereotypes about black Americans, and they continue to, and we're, we're not there yet, but we'll get there. They continue to kind of act on those prejudices, and they continue to act on those stereotypes, and they take a lot of work. Stereotypes take a lot of work to break down. They take a lot of work to, um, to, to kind of to change, to turn around. And so one of the answers, why, why do we keep talking about this, might be the idea that it, it just takes a long time to change those things, right? You just can't change someone's mind by saying, hey, you're wrong, it's actually this way. Oh, I never thought of it that way. That never happens, right? It takes a lot of convincing, right? Especially because some of these things are subconscious, right? They're not really in our conscious mind, they're kind of under the surface. And so they take a lot of, it just takes a lot of talking sometimes to change the perspective or change people's perspective and to change their stereotypes. And Daniel, I think what you said also as well is that, shoot, what did you say? Oh, <laughs> I, I just had it. Um, you, you said, oh yeah, to, you know, to solve problems, you have to keep talking about them, right? Particularly complicated ones, you know, simple ones you can, you know, you can have a conversation and you're done, but this is a complicated process, right? And it needs to be talked about. Um, and so I understand what you're saying. And like, you don't want to keep pointing out people's group memberships. You don't want to reduce people to, you know, black woman, white man, Muslim, you know, you know, disabled person in a wheelchair. You don't want to just sort of, 
you know, you, you don't want to be like labeling and tagging people and figuring out where they fit. Like it's not really about that, but we do have to understand how society affects people and part of that has to do with their group membership. And so, yeah, it, it doesn't need to be said, but in some ways it does because again, it takes a long time to change people's, um, to change people's ideas. And if you look at the United States, I mean, the, the Civil War, um, I think, ended in 18, my, my U.S. history is really bad, 1863 or 4, and then I think 1865 we get the Emancipation Declaration, right, where Abraham Lincoln signs that thing saying that slaves are free, right? So that's 1865, and so for, what are we looking at, 160 or 70 years, 160 or 70 years, we're still dealing with racism, right? And so it's still not over. In theory, it was over in 1865, right? But in reality, not so much, right? And it's still a thing. And so, yeah, the, the US a, as, a, as a country has been having a conversation about race for 170 years and it's not over, right? In fact, it's just getting, it's just heating up again. So yeah, th th these things take a long time. They, in some ways they shouldn't, and in some ways it's like frustrating that people don't get it yet, but it takes a long time. <laughs> um, is, is that, uh, how, how are you feeling about that? Yeah. Why are you talking about it? You're just making it more like, you know? Yes. And, and, and I, would say, I would say you're correct, right? There's, you know, talking is good, but like, do something, right? Like, are, are we going to do something meaningful about this? And that's, that's, an important, that's an important piece of social justice, right? Not just identifying the problem, but actually attempting to fix it. Um, and that part has been you know, has undoubtedly been slow to happen. And Canada is no exception to that. We can talk about Canada a little bit later, but um, Canada's relationship with indigenous peoples, the attempts to kind of repair that relationship and to sort of put them on an equal footing have been frustratingly slow. And yeah, so I get that. Talk is great, but action's good too, right? Um, yeah, so absolutely, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you on that front, is that, you know, talking, it's important to talk, but it's also important to do, right, to, to follow up on that. Um, I'm going to go to Abby's question here. So do, does privilege count as an example of positionality? Um, no, no, but privilege is something that has to do with where you kind of are in society. And so we haven't gotten here yet either, but privilege is something that you kind of have more or less of depending on the place that you, you know, that your, your group identities. And so it's not, it's not an example of positionality and it's not the same as positionality, but privilege is um, influenced by positionality. But we'll, We'll, we'll press, if you don't mind, Abby, we'll, we'll press pause on privilege right now, and, but we will, we will get to it, I guarantee you. Um, Nasra, are you okay mm -hmm. at the moment? Okay. Let me just see here. Um, uh, Nicole asked me to please repeat the questions being asked in class so we can hear them clearly. I'll do my best to, to do that, Nicole. Sorry if I, if I didn't do that. Um, okay. Are, are, are we okay for the moment? Are we okay? All right. Um, always, always, always. Um, yeah, if you, if you have a question, if you don't understand something, if there's something that like, you know, that, that I'm talking about that you're like, well, well, no, like well, why is this or what's going on here? Absolutely ask it because again, it's, it's, worth, it's, it's worth talking about. That was worth talking about and, and will be worth talking about. 
Um, and again, you know, if you're thinking it, other people are probably thinking it too. So it's good to get it out there and we can, we can discuss. Um, I think I kind of, oh yeah. So we talked about this positionality idea in terms of how you walk through the world determines what you see and particularly how people treat you. So again, imagine if you woke up tomorrow as a celebrity, right? If you were Dwayne The Rock Johnson or Rihanna or any celebrity of your choosing, really. If you woke up tomorrow and you were them, would the world treat you differently? Yeah. yeah. If Basil comes in here today and sits in his seat there, you know, we're going to treat him one way. But if Dwayne The Rock Johnson shows up tomorrow and <laughs> sits in his seat, everybody's going to freak out, right? I'm going to freak out a little bit. So, again, it's an extreme example, but I mean, society treats us differently, right? Not everybody gets exactly the same treatment. And so, um, yeah, we should, we should remember that. Um, so again, we've talked about all these social categories that we belong to, our gender, our age, our appearance. Good-looking people, do they get treated a little differently from less good-looking people? Yeah. yeah, they do, right? And, and both, both Dwayne The Rock Johnson and um, Rihanna kind of fall into that category. Not only are they celebrities, but they're extremely good-looking, and so they're going to get treated differently than those of us who are a little more average-looking, right? Um, our race, our ethnicity, our religious affiliation, uh, our mental and physical ability, our social and economic class, our nationality or citizenship status or language ability, all of those things are going to influence how society treats us, right? And so, again, we don't want to reduce people to, you know, a bunch of labels and just, you know, and, and sort of organize people that way. But we do want to be aware of the fact that the groups people belong to influence their experience, right? We, we, want, we want to remember that. Um, and <coughs> part of this, part of what I wanted to mention, Nazar, is a part of this is socialization. Part of this is the idea that we haven't really been taught to pay attention to those things. And in fact, we've been taught to pay attention to the exact opposite, right? We are, we are supposed to see people as individuals, right? We're not supposed to pay attention to their race or religion or um, gender. We're supposed to treat people as unique people, right? Which is, which is good, which is true, which is how we should do things. But again, for this class, we also want to keep an eye on those other group memberships as well. We want to pay attention to those as well. Um, right. I'm going to switch gears a little bit from identity to this, um, to what we're talking about with knowledge. Um, one of the things that we're going to try to imagine here is that knowledge is kind of a tricky thing, right? When we think of knowledge, we kind of think of facts, right? Things that are true, things that we know to be true. We live in a solar system with a sun, and there's a bunch of planets that go around it. How many planets are there? One, two, three, four, five, eight? Eight. Pluto doesn't count anymore though, right? Yeah. Right, no? You think they could include him, right? There's, there's only eight. There's only eight planets. There's not another planet for like billions of light years, and yet, uh, no, Pluto, you can't, you can't be part of the group. There's no other group for Pluto to join just out there on its own, circling around. It's kind of sad. It's racist. You think, what? It's I don't know if it's racism, but it's kind of like, you know, you could at least include him in the group. There's, there's nobody else. I don't know. I feel bad for Pluto. Um, anyway, these are, this is knowledge, right? This is fact. We know this to be the case. There's a sun. There's a bunch of planets. Our planet revolves around the sun, right, or rotates around the sun. But one of the things we said is that knowledge can be counterintuitive, right? And so here is an example for you. Does this look right to you? Yes. It does? Perfect. Perfect? The earth is flat. To some people it is. To some people it is. Um, yes. So. 
here we have a flat Earth. And so, depending on who you talk to, um, the Earth can be either round or flat. Who would say that the Earth is in fact round, that is a sphere? Sure. H how do we know that it's a sphere? How do we know that it's a, a ball? There's no such thing as the edge of the world, right? If you sail or fly or walk in one direction, you're going to eventually, yeah, you're going to come around to the other side, right? I don't know if anyone's ever tried to do that directly, but that is possible. Basil, what did you say? Right. People, people have gone out to space, right? And they've taken pictures of the Earth. And that is not the picture that emerges. The picture that emerges is a ball, right, floating in space. How else do we know that the Earth is round, that it's a sphere? Math. What? Math. Math? OK, so uh, do, you have, do you have a little more than that? Sure, people, people have done experiments, right? They've done mathematical calculations and they've been able to demonstrate it that way. Shane, what did you say? Yeah, first there was a like judge named Kaya Hope. He was like he discovered the number that like he discovered that the earth is round and the number was three point one four is like this number is never end. Mm. So also this number shows that the, if this number never ends and it's like three point one four this number uses in like every formula you can use that in your mathematical calculations to demonstrate that we have a round Earth, right? Basil? If the Earth is flat, uh, the point four is going to be how much? Yeah, I guess, well, I guess depending on how the sun moves, right? But maybe, right? So day and night would be, might be weird. Um, how else, any, any other way that we know that the Earth is round? Or that it's a sphere? Okay, so here's the counterintuitive part, right? Do we, do we experience the world as round? No, right? When you look out the window, what do you see? Flat Earth, right? It looks pretty flat to me. If I, put, if I drop a ball outside, will it roll away to the other side of the planet? No, it just sits there. It's, yeah, gravity kind of holds it there, but it doesn't, certainly doesn't roll away. Even if I like give it a shot and give it some momentum, does it roll away to the other side of the planet? No, people aren't, you know, over in China wondering where is the ball coming from now, right? <laughs> no, it's, it doesn't work that way. It just sits there, right? It's kind of a funny image though, right? Yeah, <laughs> this ball rolls by. Like, well. um, yeah, it doesn't work that way, right? We, we experience the world as flat. So the idea that it's round is counterintuitive, right? We don't, we don't perceive the world that way unless you pay very close attention or unless you do some, some measurements, right? So do some calculations. And so, again, we all believe that the world is a sphere. It's round, even though we don't experience it that way, right? We experience it as being flat. And, of course, we know the answer is because the ball is so big that it just seems flat when you're standing on it, but it is indeed round. Now, yeah, so a round Earth, we know, unless you're kind of a conspiracy theorist, we know that it's round, but again, it challenges our common sense. We look out the window, looks flat to me, right? Put something on the floor, it doesn't roll away to the other side of the planet. Right? And so here in Vancouver, if you go to, well, actually, you probably have to go to Vancouver Island because it's in the way. But if you go to the other side of Vancouver Island, can you see Japan? No, you cannot see Japan, right? Because it's curved away, right? It's beyond the horizon. And again, if you sail a ship to Japan from, um, from Vancouver Island, you won't see it all the way until it gets to Japan, right? It will actually disappear because it goes around, right? It goes below the horizon. What's that? So you're saying the round earth, you should be high enough. If you go high enough, you can see the 
That's true. If you can get yourself high enough, either on a mountain or in a plane, eventually you will see it'll curve, right, if you can get high enough. Now, again, some of these things seem ridiculous to say, right? The idea of a flat earth is like, of course not, right? Although, strangely, there are some people that still believe it. Um, but why are we talking about this? Well, because again, why are we, why are we talking about this? Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, I think we're talking about this because there are people who still believe in a flat Earth. Have you ever heard of flat Earthers? Yeah, some people very strongly believe that the picture I showed you before is that's how it is. It's flat, and that you can actually sail off the edge. So that's weird. Nasra's like, what the heck? Are <laughs> that's, that's kind of a weird. It's because of the surface. Then. It's because of? It's better than the surface. Then. Some people believe that we're on the surface. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, so th there's, yeah, so actually if you look at, this is interesting actually, but if you look at world religions, there's a lot of different conceptions about how the earth is, what the earth is and where we are. Um, some of them are spherical, some of them are flat, some of them are on the back of a turtle shell. Um, let me see, what else is there? There's, there's a number of different kind of conceptions of, what the world and the universe look like, depending on, what's that? Oh, right, maybe it's a simu the, the matrix idea, that we're all, we're all in a simulation. That's kind of weird and creepy, actually. Has anyone seen The Matrix or those Matrix movies from the 1990s? Yeah, they're kind of weird, eh? It's kind of like, like I know it's science fiction, but it's also weird to think like, oh, the only reason I think I exist in this world is because my senses and my brain tell me that I do. And so what if, what if that information is wrong, right? Which is creepy. Yeah, it's creepy, right? It's really creepy. Um, when you talk to flat earthers, it's interesting. Maybe I'll show you a video on this tomorrow. I took it out of this um, slideshow earlier, but, um, but Really, the reason we're talking about this is because the idea that, again, when we talk about social inequality and social justice and the construction of knowledge and how people's position in society changes what they see, what we'll see is that some things are, in fact, counterintuitive, right? Some things you think wouldn't be the case actually, actually are. But again, from our perspective, from our position, they are difficult to see. And so, just like the flat Earth, right? It's, it's, yes, we know the Earth is round, it's a thing, it's been demonstrated, but again, it's hard for us to kind of see that in our daily lives, right? You have to do some math, or you have to maybe watch a ship that goes below the horizon, or maybe you have to climb a mountain so that you can just barely see the Earth, earth start to curve at the edges a bit you have to kind of work hard to see that perspective. But in your regular life, it doesn't, doesn't seem that way, right? And so we have to be similarly open to the idea that the way that things look to us might not be the way that they are, right? And there might be people who can actually see the curvature of the earth better than I, better than we can, right? People who are on the top of a mountain or people who are in space, right? They will be able to see something that we can't see, just like, just like the board. Um, and again, the, the flat earthers, they've got a whole other thing going on, but flat earthers are kind of the people that really feel that their, their, pers that their perspective is the only one, right? They are seeing reality, right? And so basically flat earthers are saying, there's no board in this room. What are you talking about? I don't, there's no board. I can clearly see there's no board. You're all brainwashed, right? You're all brainwashed. There's no board in this room. Look, I, I'm looking at the room. There's no board, 
right? And yet, all of you can clearly see that it exists, right? And so, again, this, this is another example that we have to be open to the idea that, you know, some things might be happening that are difficult to perceive and difficult to see. And sometimes difficult to even know if and when they're happening. So we have to be open to those ideas is what I'm trying to communicate to you. So the first week is always a little tough on my, <clears throat> tough on my voice because I don't talk quite so much over the break. And so my <clears throat> I'm getting a little rough, but that's okay. Um, I'd like to sort of take a pause here and how, how are we doing? Is this kind of making some sense? Yeah? Okay. It's what? It's yeah, it's kind of interesting, hey? Um, do you have any questions or comments or things that you would like to say or things that kind of popped into your head while we were talking about these things that you might want to throw? When are you going to What's that? When are you going to when it, I'm not entertaining enough for you? Mm. Um, few weeks, a couple weeks, few weeks. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to warn you ahead of time so that you can plan for the popcorn. Yes. Why should we care about them? <laughs> well, um, why why should we why should we care about these flat Earth people? What's that? They are humans. They have rights. <clears throat> yes, just ignore them. Um, that's a good question, but uh, I might turn it a little bit and say, you know, if we, <clears throat> these flat earth people are a small group of people, admittedly, there's not many of them, um, and, and they believe in something that is, I think we can agree is, clearly false, right? It is demonstrably false that the Earth is flat. We know it's flat. We've got lots of proof. Yeah, it, duh, right? Of course. But <clears throat> they're easy to ignore. They're a small group. They have these little conferences where they, you know, spread their little conspiracy theories and whatever. Who cares, right? But let's turn that a little bit because, you know, we... Just last week, we saw a group of people storm the Capitol in Washington, D.C. and break into the Senate chamber based on the belief that the election was stolen and that there was massive voter fraud and their country had been taken from them. And are any of those things true? No, they don't seem to be. There seems to be no evidence for that whatsoever. So those people, you know, committed violence and broke into their state capital, whether they were attempting to take over the government is a open question, but they did that based on a belief that is that has no basis in fact. And so I would say that, yeah, we can probably ignore these flat earth people, right? It's a little bit ridiculous, but we shouldn't ignore the pattern that some people are very willing to believe ideas that have no factual basis, right? There's, there's nothing to say that the Earth is flat, and in fact, all the evidence says that the Earth is round, and there's similarly nothing to indicate that there was massive voter fraud and that the election was stolen. There's no evidence, and in fact, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary, that it actually was a reasonably secure election, and the outcome is pretty clear, right? In terms of the electoral votes, it's, it's a very clear win for for Joe Biden, but some people refuse to believe that. And so, yeah, the flat earthers I think we can ignore, but I think we should pay attention to the idea that some people are willing to believe things that are very clearly false. And not only do they believe them, but they believe them so strongly that they will storm, yeah, they will storm the Capitol based on those beliefs. And that's I think that's worth paying attention to. The flat earth thing is kind of silly. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think we should pay attention to at least the pattern, the pattern that, that's going on. 
Whew, okay. Do you want to call it there for today? Is that okay? What's that? My call? Okay, we're going to call it. We only got two minutes. We'll call it there for today. We'll come back tomorrow and we'll finish up with this knowledge thing. And um, we might start to talk about socialization tomorrow. We'll see how we see how we how it goes. Okay. So thank you all for being here, good people. And I'll that's it. I'll see you tomorrow. Or for some of you, I'll see you in 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, bye bye.